Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. Can you think back to your own schooling, to the times you were sitting in a class, listening to a teacher talk about a topic, and simultaneously felt you were missing basic details, preventing you from grasping the point of the lesson? If you were never taught to conjugate verbs properly in Spanish, it's hard to say basic phrases such as, we went to the restaurant. If you wanted to become an amazing guitarist, but your music teacher didn't go through major minor scales with you, there would be a piece of the puzzle missing. In school, I had this experience a lot. I sat in a lot of history classes in high school and college where the teaching in a bunch of topics was just simply beyond me. I lacked basic understandings of who, where, what, why, when, which prevented me from grasping the bigger picture of far too many college lectures. I have since come to believe that the entirety of life is for learning, and if we don't know something, it's fully acceptable to admit it and learn about it if you want to, even at age 35, 55, or 85. Today is an exciting episode for me because it is about a history topic that I essentially didn't understand in school at all or at university. The topic is Byzantium, and my guest is Dr. Anthony Caldellis. Anthony Caldellis is professor and chair of the Department of Classics at The Ohio State University. He is the author of many books, including The Christian Parthenon, Hellenism in Byzantium, and the Byzantine Republic. The focus of today's conversation is his latest book, Roman Land, Ethnicity and Empire in Byzantium, out now from Harvard University Press. We talk about where Byzantium was located, who lived there, how people in Byzantium viewed themselves racially and ethnically, the origin of the term Byzantine, the nitty gritty of how ancient and medieval societies work, and the future of the academic field of Byzantine studies. As always, if you like this show, you can find me on Twitter at classical underscore ideas, on Facebook at facebook.com slash classical ideas podcast, or you can support the show financially on Patreon at patreon.com slash classical ideas podcast. It was a real treat to have Dr. Caldellis on the show, and I hope you enjoy our conversation on Byzantium and the fantastic new book, Roman Land, Ethnicity and Empire in Byzantium. Dr. Anthony Caldellis, thank you so much for coming on Classical Ideas. Thank you for having me, Greg. Can you just spend a moment and kind of introduce yourself to the audience, however you see fit? Uh, Sure. Uh, I am a professor of classics at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. But uh, my PhD degree is in history from the University of Michigan. So I'm a historian um, who has been in a classics department for the last 20 years. And my expertise um, is in Byzantine history and culture and civilization and literature. And uh, that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty rare in that regard. There are not very many Byzantinists in classics departments. They're usually in history departments or in art history departments. Uh, but, uh, th- I think that's the only thing about me that's relevant to our listeners. My biography isn't particularly exciting. Cool. Okay. So I love hearing a little bit about the context of how my guests got into their fields and their areas of interest. Um, and so I went through a bunch of history classes as an undergrad at the University of Missouri, um, which we can talk about in a second, but can you tell me a little bit about how your path led to becoming a Byzantine studies scholar? Like, were there any important turning points or important mentors or right place at the right time kind of situations? Like, what were some of your major um, points in your journey? Sure. Well, I actually started out as a physicist uh, with an interest in biology, Um, And it was through sort of intellectual questions uh, that I had that uh, the hard sciences don't actually answer very well or didn't at the time. Uh, This was in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, And I gradually drifted over into philosophy and history. Um, This is something that the American college system allows you to do. Um, Yeah. 
you know, take courses here and there until you find something that works for you intellectually. Um, and so at the time, my main interest shifted from the kinds of sort of philosophical uh, questions that you get to through the sciences to the kinds of philosophical questions that you get to through philosophy. Uh, and so that was what I wanted to do. But I also knew at the time that writing on philosophy or having philosophical ideas was not something that one should do in one's 20s or 30s. <laughs> Even and you know, I mean, Plato's Republic. He says something about don't do it until you're sixty or something like that. <laughs> and I also had I developed historical interests along the side, and I thought, well, so this is my this is my twenty year old plan. I was twenty twenty one or something. I love it. I no, it's great. Yeah, I'll I'll become a historian because one can actually do work in history, you know, publish and write books and so on without having to have philosophical answers to big questions, right? Um, and, and I'll do that because I'm very interested in that and I have a lot of ideas about it, but that will also be a, a, a means by which to keep me in the university, um, the university world where I can do my philosophy on the side. Uh, well, uh, well, to make a long story short, I simply ended up becoming a historian, um, as philosophical, as the answers to philosophical questions sort of receded further and further into, you know, the haze, um, and what was my secondary interest or hobby, that is history, actually became primary. And so now I study how a lot of big questions, important questions for human society, have played out um, historically in the past two or 3,000 years. Um, in terms of mentors, well, so, yeah, actually, you're, you're quite right that there, there you know, some decisions are the product of circumstance. Um, I, when I was deciding, okay, well, I'm going to be a historian, what field should it be? I was initially attracted to Renaissance history, um, as a kind of turning point in the history of the imagined West. We can get to that later. Um, and it, it was in part because I had a wonderful professor. This was at Michigan, Marvin Becker, um, historian of the Italian Renaissance, who lectured on it as if he had lived there and knew these people and he was wonderful, but he was in his eighties and almost blind and was not taking on more students. Um, so I looked around a little bit and um, another professor I had taken courses with and admired a lot was John Fine, who was a Balkan, medieval Balkan Byzantine historian, again at Michigan. He was an absolutely wonderful person. Um, and so I thought, well, <laughs> I might as well work with him. Um, it helped also that, you know, those two fields, while you might not think of them together, actually do kind of inhabit the same scholarly ecosystem in terms of languages and periods. And they did actually intersect at one point in the 14th, 15th centuries. Um, so I became a Byzantinist, but there was an intellectual dimension to this. Um, my philosophical interests had led me to ancient Greek philosophy um, and early Christianity as kind of formative forces um, in, in, the, in the history that we're all still living in. Um, and the more I read, the more I realized that these things came together in the context of the Roman Empire. Um, and so one thing led to another, and if you follow the threads, those threads come together in one and only one place, which is Byzantium. That is a Roman state um, with a Roman identity that, whose majority population speaks Greek, that they preserved the ancient Greek classics that we still have. We have them because they preserved them. Um, and that was Christian and Orthodox and drew its Christianity from the original sources, both the New Testament and the church fathers and the church councils of the early Byzantine period. And Byzantium was the only place where those three came together in what one might call their original form. Uh, if you look at any other society, one of one is usually missing or two. And so I thought it would be an interesting uh, laboratory to study the intersection and combination of those three cultural elements which are so important uh, for history generally 
That's a remarkable sort of segue into discussing your latest book, Roman Land, Ethnicity and Empire in Byzantium from Harvard Press. So I want to start off by uh, confessing a few of my shortcomings as, um, you know, a student of history. So at Mizzou, whenever I was an undergrad, I, you know, I would take all these different history classes, but here's where I am with regards to the topic of the book that we're going to discuss. So when studying these topics of like pre-modern or ancient societies, my brain just sort of stops working when specifics are discussed because like in the past, I feel that all of my teachers have just gone immediately above my head. So I would be sitting in these college classes having no idea what was going on because I never got a basic foundation. But what I loved immediately about your book is that you made me feel better Um, when you said in your introduction that there are fundamental confusions about the term Byzantine Empire and that there is an opaque lack of clarity within the field itself. So this made me breathe like a huge sigh of relief because um, you kind of met me as a learner, kind of like where I am, which is to say I know very little about the topic and would largely have these memories of zoning out when my college professors would discuss things like Byzantium because they would assume a level of pre-understanding on the topic that I didn't have. And I don't, and I really didn't know the basics, so I couldn't even follow like these intro lectures in college. My question to you is this. Um, after having hearing that, and I'm sh- assuming you see a lot of the similar trends in your own students, do you? how do you handle teaching about a field that you know most students already misunderstand because of long-standing confusion within the field itself. Right. Um, so <laughs> that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, oh my gosh, it, I've been thinking it, about this for weeks. No, it really goes to the heart of you know how we teach uh, pre-modern societies to mo- to undergraduates today, um, or, or really teach any field. Um, and, and I think it's safe to assume that um, college students who are taking their first course on a topic either have, you know, harbor deep misunderstandings about it, which they've gathered from you know, anywhere from high school or Assassin's Creed or you know, whatever, <laughs> um, to not knowing anything about it, right? Um, and so we just, it's it's safest to assume that and go in, you know, with a with, with a um, a plan uh, to either build them up from really basic elements um, or find the narrative that they have and work with that, right? So let's take those two approaches. One is the build up from sort of the most fundamental uh, foundations. And the second would be to find the narrative that they think they know and work within that. Mm. So the first approach, um, actually, you know, beyond questions of like, what is Byzantium? Who were these people? Uh, you know, and so forth. It's it's actually a challenge to get students to understand what life in a pre-modern society is like. Just just from no matter when or where, like without electricity, right? Without instant communication, right? The speed of life, right? Being so slow. Um, how you get food, what kind of food this is, what it does to your body, um, and also that for anything to be done, a person or a person working with an animal has to physically do it. Like the, and I, I think that these are things that they've sort of they're sort of dimly aware of, but they don't quite understand what it means on the level of you know the life of the individual or social life and so on. Like they haven't worked it through. Um, so that's one thing, uh, just building them up from agricultural society, like what's that like? And how can you have a state like, or even like an empire, right, that does things like have armies or build churches? How can you do that on that basis, right? So that's a that's not specific to Byzantium. It's just a very general historical concern. For sure. Um, and But I think that I start this way and, and it just kind of immersing them in this in this very different world. Now, as for the narrative, um, I'm assuming that, and and so far I'm I'm correct in this, but the, the narrative that they know about Byzantium has something to do with the fall of the Roman Empire, and 
they've been told that there was this thing called the Roman Empire and that it fell and then medieval history started and you get to the Renaissance and then to the modern nation states. And the students who take classes on Byzantium, in my experience here, uh, I mean, apart from those, you know, maybe some just fit their schedule and that's all they want. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, but if they have any specific interest in taking that course, it's because they've come across Byzantium in some context that leads them to think that that narrative is um, uh, deficient in some way. Um, and, and, and they're right. And so you can take that, that narrative of, you know, the Roman Empire to medieval Europe to modern Europe and say, well, that's half the story. Um, and you don't have to say that, that that narrative is wrong. It's just a very partial narrative. And that was only half the Roman. The fall of the Roman Empire was the fall of half of the Roman Empire and not necessarily the more interesting half, um, depending on what your interests are. But so the Eastern Roman Empire did not fall at all. In fact, it was doing quite well at the time. Um, and it continued on, uh, its historical existence was uninterrupted until the 15th century, uh, when it was finally conquered, what was left of it was conquered by the Ottoman Turks. And this has a whole range of consequences. So first of all, they realize, well, okay, so we're talking about the history of the other half of the Roman Empire. We're also talking about the history of um, the other half of the Christian church, if you understand it as sort of Catholic and Orthodox. Um, and what was that history about? Um, and in the course of doing that, that is getting them to realize that, well, there's this other wing to that historical existence of like Roman Empire, history of the Christian church. I also introduce a third one, which is the Islamic world. Um, that was in many ways also an heir to the Roman Empire. And also it was home to very, very many Christians and a different church, the Church of the East. Um, which in some centuries had as many people in it as the Orthodox or Catholic churches. Um, and so you, this sort of, that, that narrative enables me to expand the picture and, uh, you know, work them into some areas that they never would have imagined would come up. So Byzantium is situated in this narrative right in the middle. <laughs> what yeah. I wanted, right? So there's Western Europe, uh, which uses Latin and has the Catholic Church, and there's Byzantium in the middle, which is Greek speaking and becomes, gives rise to the Orthodox Church. And then in the East, we have um, a very complicated situation with Muslim states that have very, very many Christian subjects um, and various Christian churches that some of them dimly survive today. I mean, they, they anyway, their, their long term trajectory was not. Um, yeah, you know, not kind, but, uh, right. Yeah. Well, and you just said something too, like the, a phrase that stands out to me is other half of the Roman empire. And you just now saying that to me clarifies years of my personal misunderstandings about this area of the world. I mean, just that one line, the other half of the Roman empire, if somebody had ever said that to me in a class, I feel like so many misconceptions would have just cleared up instantaneously. Like, that's what I'm talking about. Like, um, this is so powerful to just take it and just really break it down. Do you see any trends in, like, how you've uh, taught? Like, have you changed how you've taught this over the years whenever you've noticed any misconceptions? Like, how are you developing your own teaching as you go further into your career? Well, I, at first I thought that students would know ancient history better than they did yeah like classical history and it turns out that they don't right so and in a certain sense that was frustrating because i started out by presenting byzantium in in, in ancient terms as if they meant anything to people like you know ancient city states or ancient paganism and things like this just to show how it changed and then I realized that I didn't need to do that um, unless it was important to the topic at hand because they didn't have that background. Um, and after a while, I realized, well, this is kind of liberating in its own way. Um, they all know about the Roman Empire. To some degree, we talk about that a little bit and then take the story from there. Um, and I don't assume knowledge of anything. 
um, you just you build that up, um, you know, from from the beginning. Like, what does it mean to be Roman in the Roman Empire? Who who were these people? Um, what languages did they speak, uh, and so forth. Um, and also geography, like first week we have a geography quiz <laughs> and, uh, you know, like, and I just tell them you will learn the location of every country in, in Europe, North Africa and the Middle East. Um, and I will give you a blank map and tell you, you know, like, so where's Bulgaria, where's Tunisia and you will put them on the map. Nice. Um, let, yeah, let, yeah. let's do that. Let's do some terminology really quick. Can, you want to? <laughs> Sure, sure. Awesome. Okay, so really quick, um, because I'd imagine that a lot of people who are listening to this have no idea what uh, Byzantium is. Honestly, I, I truly think this. And so can you list the modern countries that currently make up what was the Byzantine? Oh, sure. Um, so the Byzantine Empire, as I said, was just the direct continuation of the Eastern Roman Empire. And it lasted in this phase for about a thousand years, and it tended over time to become smaller. Um, so the countries that it, the modern countries that it encompassed diminished <laughs> over time. So let's start with this. The capital of the Eastern Roman Empire was Constantinople, which is the modern city of Istanbul in Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, so so Turkey is mostly Turkey is what we also call Asia Minor. Um, but it, Istanbul is on the European side of the Bosporus Straits that kind of divide Europe and Asia at that point. Um, so the capital is Constantinople. In Originally, so let's say like in the 5th century, the Eastern Roman Empire included all of the countries from, let's say, roughly the former Yugoslavia, so Greece, Bulgaria, Turkey, and then down Syria, um, Lebanon, um, Israel, Jordan, Egypt, uh, you know, that arc, right? That whole arc, the whole Eastern Mediterranean, um, all around. And it, it expanded and contracted over time in the middle Byzantine period. So roughly from the seventh to the 12th century. So this is after the, um, Islamic conquests of the seventh century. So, right. So Arabs and Muslims come along and they take away sort of Syria, Egypt, leaving Byzantium as only a smaller Balkan state, so parts of Greece. Later, they reconquered Bulgaria. And the core of it was Asia Minor, modern Turkey. So that was the, the, the real base. And it then expanded a little bit again to include most of the southern Balkans. So uh, most countries uh, south of the Danube, uh, again, the f former Yugoslavia are parts of it. Um, Albania, Bulgaria, Greece, and Turkey. So that's that's the core. And then it shrank again from there down to just Constantinople and a few islands and the Peloponnese in Greece when it was conquered by the Ottoman Turks in the 15th century. So that's the geographical um, uh, environment. Awesome. Okay, so what is the scholarly accepted consensus for dates of existence? Like what? when does this begin? When does this end? The beginning is very uh, contentious and arbitrary. It's not that contentious. It's so arbitrary. We all know it's arbitrary. Gotcha. So, you know, historians just say, well, I'm just going to begin my story. And yeah. So <laughs> there are a number of points that you could say. You, some, some historians prefer the foundation of Constantinople. This was by the Emperor Constantine, the first Christian emperor. Um, and he created this city. Uh, it, was, it was dedicated on... Um, 11th of May, 330. So you could pick that date. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this is just an emperor within an existing Roman Empire just creating a new city. It, it's not like some major rupture or anything. Um, when sometimes people pick the Historians will sometimes choose the fall of the Western Empire whenever that was, maybe sometime in the 5th century. Others will simply start with the um, uh, Islamic conquests of the seventh century and say, well, I'm going to talk about the reduced Roman empire, like to the Balkans and Asia minor after the seventh century. Um, so that's probably the latest beginning point. Um, so you have to realize that these are all very arbitrary because it's just the continuous existence of the Roman state. Yeah. You know, historians are just picking dates to start that suit their, you know, research interests. Um, the end is a bit clearer, yeah. 
um, which is the, you know, 1453 uh, in May when the Ottomans take the capital. Now, there were still some outposts of the empire left, which the, the Turks, you know, mopped up after that. Uh, but, you know, by the 1460s, most of those had fallen. So at that point, we are no longer dealing with, there is no Roman polity. It had come to an end. Now, its former subjects lived on, right, under the Ottoman Empire. They continue to be called Romans um, down to the 19th, even early 20th century. So at that point, it just becomes a different history. It's the history of, it would be the history of a group uh, mm. in the Ottoman Empire, but it's not written that way. So Byzantinists generally go down to the 15th century. Gotcha. Okay, so the subject of Roman land mentions the word ethnicities, and you were just kind of bringing that topic into play just now. I'm curious about who the ethnic minorities were that lived within the Byzantine. Like, who were the minority population? Because then we'll get into the majority population, and then we'll kind of springboard from there. Sure. So let's start, let's just uh, work with the middle Byzantine period. So roughly 7th to 12th centuries, because it's it's a bit more compact Um the earlier period is, um, you know, that includes Egypt and Syria. That's much more complicated. We right. can do that if you want. But the book really focuses on the Middle Byzantine period. And the ethnicities are those that are named in the sources. Um, so especially in the uh, Greek sources, which are the majority of our sources for Byzantium. Um, and they would include groups such as Jews, uh, Armenians, um, Slavs, Bulgarians, Arabs, Turks, and various other groups that no longer exist, Goths, um, and, and so forth. Um, there were groups of Iranians that entered the empire. Um, so, and these are named in the sources. They're not, they're not hard to find. Uh, there's nothing mysterious about it. Uh, so basically, you know, the, um, the groups that you would expect given the geographical location of the empire. Um, and the current countries that are there. Yeah. Okay. So now the majority is something that, which is the premise of the book, which um, also kind of took me by surprise whenever I started getting into this text because, you know, it's just not something we would think about today. So can you tell me a little bit about the ethnic majority that lived in this middle Byzantine period? Because this is just super fascinating and I think brand new to so many people. Sure. Well, this is the... This is the rub, right? Mm -hmm. This this is where it gets controversial. Um, if you look at the sources, whether Greek sources um, or the um, Arabic sources, talking about Byzantium at the time, you would have no doubt about who the majority population of the empire was, what they called themselves, and what they thought they were. They were Romans. Uh, they're called Romans in Greek, Romae. They're called Romans in Arabic, Rum. They wrote about themselves that way. Um, they talked about their state that way, um, and they made crucial ethnic distinctions between themselves and the ethnic minorities that we just mentioned. So they'll say, um, you know, Romans and Armenians or, you know, Romans and Turks or Romans and Albanians or whatever, as if those were different groups. Um, so, for example, sometimes they would both, so the imperial armies would have Romans, but they would also have some Bulgarians. And so they would be sometimes mentioned differently, which indicates, you know, social perceptions of difference. Now, this, so this fact is not ambiguous. It's not like you have to pull up some obscure esoteric text to find mention of Romans as the majority population of Byzantium. It's all over the place. There's thousands, tens of thousands of references to it. The question really is, why have we not taken that at face value? Mm. That's the real question. And the, the history of Byzantine studies is in many ways dominated by attempts to make sense of this civilization while denying this basic fact about it. Like that, that's kind of how it works. And this is a difficult thing to do, by the way. In other words, if you're going to write the history of civilization and you, you have to work around uh, what, you know, the people who lived in it said they were and thought they were and how they imagined their place in the world, that takes some sophistication to do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. So um, there's a long history of trying to come up with alternative ways to describe it 
that basically deny what it itself is saying. Um, some of these start um, in the Western medieval period and like around 800 or so. Um, when Western um, sources switch from calling them the, the Eastern Romans, they switch from calling them Romans to calling them Greeks, um, you know, after their language, say. And thereafter in the West, Greek was the dominant term for referring to the Eastern Romans. Now, in some cases, this you might think this is this was just this is just banal. I mean, in the same way that we call Germans Germans, but they don't call themselves that, and you know, you know, you can call them Deutsch or Alemanni or or you know whatever, but they all mean the same thing, right? So, in some um, in some contexts, the Greek label does mean that, but that wasn't its function or intent. Its intent was specifically to deny that the Eastern Romans were Romans. Um, because the Western sources said so. I mean, you're, you're not Romans, you're Greek. Um, and that continued down to the 19th century. Uh, so the dominant perception in the West of Byzantium was that it was Greek and specifically not Roman. Um, and there were, there were reasons for why that was done, and there are ideological reasons. In other words, there were institutions and people in the West, uh, the, the German emperors, for example, or the papacy that wanted to appropriate the label Roman and all the, you know, um, uh, the legacy that went with it that justified, you know, having empires or exerting authority or issuing laws for themselves and to deny it to the Eastern Empire. Okay, a question that's spring, swirling through my mind right now is if you think about Rome, and I think a lot of listeners might think of like Italy and Rome and things like that, is there anything, does race come into this at all? So you write that like the medieval Greeks of the Byzantine were stripped of their ethnicity and they became deracinated Byzantines. So does the does race come into play because we wouldn't think of the Eastern Romans as like like with Roman, like I don't know, racial features? Well, not, not really, though in Western, in European historiography, especially in like the 19th and 20th centuries, you don't, you don't have to look very far until concepts of race start kind of intruding into the thinking process. That almost, that almost happens inevitably in that tradition. Uh, so let's back up a little bit. Sure, sure. Because... Um, like to antiquity, uh, Roman was not a race, um, never talked about that way. And it couldn't have been. The Romans themselves knew perfectly well that their city had started. I mean, there was a whole myth, right, about Romulus and the Sabine yeah. women and so forth. So like the the Romans understood their city as a place where, you know, either that absorbed other people, turned them into Romans and that expanded by not only through conquest, that was obviously very important, but by distributing its citizenship uh, to people it conquered. Um, now, eventually, um, and this happened in the early third century AD, eventually, a Roman emperor um, simply enfranchised the entire population of the empire, um, minus slaves, uh, of course. Um, who aren't citizens legally, um, but everyone else was made into a Roman citizen. So Rome was always a polity of law, um, and that is, it was defined by law and by political institutions. Um, and belonging to it certainly entailed, you know, adhering to certain cultural conventions and, you know, ideas about authority and so forth. In other words, it wasn't a, it wasn't a kind of well everyone is welcome just yeah come along right I mean it, it always happened under specific circumstances, um, but it was very expansive, and so there was no concept of race. In other words, uh, I mean e even if you pick the early Roman Empire, you have Romans in Spain and Gaul and North Africa and everywhere. Uh, eventually, also in the East and and so forth. At the same time. The ancient, so Greek and Greek culture was a very important part of ancient Rome, right? So the Roman aristocracy, the Senate, like Julius Caesar, right? When he, they knew Greek. Um, it, sometimes they were bilingual in it. Like, so when Caesar was, was stabbed in the neck, <laughs> right? And he said, et tu Brutus. Yeah. But he said that in Greek, mm -hmm. right? 
Um, and this isn't the circumstance where one would say, oh, now how do you, how do you parse, you know, the, no. Um, so a lot of the, you know, prominent Romans that we know from history, Caesar and Augustus and all this, they were bilingual in Greek. So, so Rome is a civilization that is very expansive in who it takes in. A Roman was um, either a citizen or a member of the polity or some nexus of those two things. Um, and it, it wasn't a racial category or even an ethnic one necessarily. Um, it was more like what we might think of as a national one. Um, and so discussions of race can't, aren't really helpful here. Um, in other words, being a Roman rarely ever meant like, how would you prove that you, you proved your Romanness by tracing your ancestors back to some right gotcha, founding yeah. like, founder. It wasn't like that. Yeah. So, you know, universal enfranchisement was in, in, in 212 uh, AD. Uh, so by the time we, so long before we have anything recognizably Byzantine, the Eastern Romans had been Romans for, for centuries, many of them. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't that, um, it wasn't a preposterous notion in antiquity that you could have Greek speaking Romans in the East. That was, that was banal. Um, but it was problematic in medieval Europe much, much later on when you start identifying Roman with Latin specifically, with the Catholic Church specifically, with German emperors specifically, there it became more problematic. Um, and uh, those institutions did not want to give Byzantium um, uh, entry into the sort of Roman kind of ideas of power that they were constructing. Um, and, there, and then there was one more move that was made in the 19th century, and this was very decisive. So until the early 19th century in the West, Byzantium was talked about as a Greek culture, a Greek entity, right, populated with Greeks. And how do you know this? Well, they speak Greek. <laughs> um, in the 19th century, that changed. By the end of the 19th century, the, that idea of Byzantium as part of the history of the Greeks had disappeared largely in the West and had been replaced by this abstract concept, Byzantium, um, which had never been used this way before. The word existed. So a bit of background. Byzantium was simply the name of the city where Constantine founded Constantinople. So there was a city there. He didn't start from scratch. It was a much smaller Greek city called Byzantium. Um, and even the Byzantine, the people we call Byzantines, used that name to refer to the city, uh, kind of like archaically, you know, like some sort of, um, like you would refer to England as Albion or something like that. Sure, it's sure. Sort of archaizing, you know, term. But they never meant it for, like, they never used it to refer to the whole empire or to everybody in it or anything like that. Uh, when, whenever they said a Byzantine, they meant a Constantinopolitan. And, and that was rare. And they did use it, but not that often. So in the 19th century, um, this term, Byzantine, was reimagined and put into service to refer to the entire empire and its entire history and so that they could get away from Greek. And so why did that happen? Well, that has to do with the history of the 19th century, and specifically, you have the um, the creation of a modern Greek state um, that rebelled against the Ottoman Empire, and around the mid-century point, the modern Greek state began to talk about reviving the Greek Empire of the Middle Ages, which they read about in contemporary Western historians. Right? <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and so the great powers were very worried about this sort of thing. Like, no, no, like we supported you, your independence from the Ottoman Turks, but let's not go too far. And at the same time, there was widespread Russophobia in Europe. There's a fear of Russia, the Russian Empire. And the idea was, the fear was, that all this talk about a Greek empire was just basically, it was a Russian surrogate. Like, the Russians were instigating the Greeks because they were both Orthodox and, you know, they were out, like, you know, how they hang together, apparently, or something like that. And that this Greek empire would be nothing but a Russian proxy. And so the idea of talking about the empire of the Greeks suddenly became very toxic um, in, in the West. And so it was dropped. 
but now, okay, so now this leaves you with a dilemma. <laughs> you can't call it Roman because you've invested too much for too long in claiming Rome for the West. Rome is Latin. Right, right. Rome right. Is Catholic. Rome is whatever. So that's out. That's been out for a thousand years by that point. Greek is now problematic because of the political context of the 19th century. Well, let's just go for something completely made up. And so they picked Byzantine. Well, it's not completely made up, but it's definitely uh, distorted. And so you end up with a term, a category, sort of an analytical category for discussing history that doesn't really refer to anything in particular. Um, and it's just kind of bland and you, know, you can put whatever you want in it. And there's one thing that had been left untouched by all of this, and that was orthodoxy. So there was no interest or move to, you know, deny that. And so that became, so ortho, Christian orthodoxy became the default category by which Byzantine history was written for most of the 20th century. Um, and so you find this identification over and over and over again that, well, what it really was was orthodox. But that's not how the sources, that's not what the sources say. Um, There's a very strong Roman um, identity in Byzantium, and it cut through Orthodox identities, right? So if you have, um, you know, Bulgarians were Orthodox, Serbs were Orthodox, the Rus were Orthodox, but they were not regarded as Romans. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of, of uh, sort of talk of how they were barbarians and all of this stuff. Um, so there were ethnic dis distinctions in addition to uh, within this sort of Orthodox Commonwealth. Um, and so my the book, Roman Land, is trying to bring this element back out to the surface um, of the way we talk about Byzantium, because this was a very important component. Um, I mean, so was Orthodoxy, I mean, I'm not denying that, but, uh, but this was also in play. And, and in order to bring it to the surface, we have to dig pretty deeply because it's buried under many, many centuries worth of uh, distortion. So like, you write in the book about how like there are no more, they don't call themselves Eastern Europeans, Romans, Eastern European Romans today, and that they came into being and then they went extinct. What can you tell me about how they stopped calling themselves Roman? Like what was like the phase out of that terminology? Oh, that was mostly the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, so very recently. Very recently. Um, yeah, that's shockingly recent. Yeah, yeah. And until 100 years ago, you could find people who thought that you know, basically they're Roman. And there still are, by the way. This is unbelievable. Amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Th no, this is not this is not compl the story is not over. Um, I'll get to that. But but first, I want to make a, a, a distinction um, just to clarify an important point um, for, for your listeners. So when we talk about ethnic change, um, so a group of people comes into being and then, or maybe it goes extinct or, you know, how does that change happen? Well, generally we have two models for discussing this. So one is, um, a population change, right? So, you know, we have a group of people in one area and they call themselves by one name, which they understand in the context of certain narratives about themselves. And then maybe, you know, we, either have an attested movement of people from outside, they come in, or we look later and, oh, look, they're calling themselves a different thing, they have a different language. Um, and we think, well, you know, maybe a different group of people came in and, you know, brought with them a different identity, a different language, you know, whatever. So population movement is one way in which ethnic change can happen. Um, another is that the conceptions of who the of what the group is and and their narratives and their names change from within over time um, and this happens very often it happens under a number of different circumstances um, um, this is certainly easy for americans to understand uh, this being a country that um, can you know absorb foreigners with specific ethnicities and over time, like two, three generations, sometimes less, sometimes more, uh, turn them into, a, you know, a, a, or to absorb them into a broader polity, um, wherein their previous ethnic identities might not even be remembered or be remembered, um, you know, emotion, sentimentally or emotionally or whatever. Now, that happens within... 
you know, that ha- there's certain parameters within which that happens. So, for example, uh, we all know about how like Greeks and Italians and Eastern Europeans and so forth, a hundred years ago when they came to the U.S., were not considered white. <laughs> right? Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, and today their descendants are, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, I would be one of and, them. Yes, I mean, I think most most Americans by this point. Absolutely. Okay. So, so you know, if if any of our listeners belongs to such group, and think about the history of the past three or four generations and see how that happens, there are processes of assimilation uh, where you come to identify with a new a new narrative, a new label, uh, you know, and so forth. Now, as I said, that happens within certain parameters. Um, so, if you think about African Americans, that's a different story, right? that's where race comes into play. Um, and that really didn't c- come into play in, in Byzantium. Uh, it wasn't a, really a factor. I mean, I know of a couple of cases, but there are very, very few um, where, you know, it seems like some, a concept, something like race played a role, but let's set that aside for now. Um, so what happened when new groups come into being is that narratives form, people are drawn to them for one reason or another, either they get imposed or they're voluntary associations, and you have a new group emerging. All ethnicities are artificial in this way, right? (laughs) There are no primordial ethnic groups that have been roaming the earth or, or staying in one place for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years or whatever. That, that just doesn't exist. We have to really have to understand this. All groups of human beings that have names and labels are historical artifacts. They come into being at some point and most of, most of the ones that we know historically go extinct. Like that happens. Um, You know, we can talk about any number of groups that just simply no longer exist um, throughout history. And so the, the Romans, the Eastern Romans are one of these groups. Um, their ancestors used to be all kinds of things around the Eastern Mediterranean. They were absorbed into the Roman Empire. One way or another, they, they became attached to the, uh, the collectivity of the Romans, the polity of the Romans. And especially in the Middle Byzantine period, when it was much more homogeneous, in other words, it was basically Greek speaking, um, a specific version of Orthodox Christianity that we call Chalcedonian Christianity. In other words, they recognized the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD, um, and they were all part of one state. Um, this essentially became an ethnic group, right? In other words, those Romans were, they were Romans by language, by religion, by custom, by their dress, by their polity, by, you know, all of the sorts of things that um, groups point to. Um, you know, when you ask them to, you know, so show me what's distinctive about your ethnic group. Um, and they even had developed ideas about, you know, being descended from the ancient Romans. So not from the ancient Greeks. I mean, this is interesting. Right. Uh, they lived in Greece, some of them. They spoke Greek, but they didn't, not until very, very late did they start experimenting with ideas of descent from the ancient Greeks. It is almost all Roman until that point. Um, gotcha. So... Yeah, so this is a this is what we might call a process of romanogenesis. Right? Oh, great! I love this. Right? It's like, how do we take a population that's not Roman and make it Roman? Right? You know, it might take centuries, right? And it did, uh, but but it happened. Well, and yeah, and your and your discussion just now of modern examples really just kind of makes this visible in front of our very eyes in 2019 as well. Yes. Well, these are yes, these are very. Um, these are very relevant questions, but you know, they, they always are. Um, I mean, I think all human societies that are in contact with others, uh, you know, are engaged either in, in these kinds of processes of reciprocal influence, population movement. Um, but you know, and that also gives rise to, um, anxieties. Um, so if suddenly you, if you used to be the, you know, the dominant identity in a particular region, and now you are, um, a subordinate minority, what do you do? Well, you know, you can either withdraw into yourself and try to, you know, preserve the smaller group, or you can reach with both hands for the dominant identity and change in order to have more power and influence. So Greeks in the Roman Empire, you, I mean, you can see them doing both things, but in the end, it's pretty clear which process 
one. They they wanted to become Roman, um, and and they did. And there was no real impediment to that simply because they were from the east or spoke Greek. I mean, that wasn't a, that wasn't a problem. Um, uh, anyway, and the other end of this story is when this goes extinct, and it largely goes extinct in the 19th and 20th centuries. And this is when, well, so when the Greek Revolution happened. Um, so here's the tricky part. <laughs> In the West, these Eastern Romans were always called Greeks. So when some of them decided to rebel against the Ottoman Empire in 1821 and sought Western help, in fact, the Greek Revolution would have failed were it not for Western assistance, um, both state assistance and private assistance. But they couldn't very well go to their Western audiences and say, well, we Romans want independence from the Turks. That would have made no sense whatsoever in Paris and London and Columbus, Ohio. Like, well, no, Columbus, Ohio. Anyway, <laughs> the, the, there were plenty, yeah, there were plenty of volunteers in, in the United States that went to fight in the Greek Revolutionary War. And, you know, the, think of the po poet Byron and all of this. They were motivated by the idea of the the, the descendants of the Glorious ancient Greeks are trying to regain their freedom from barbarous despotism. Let's go help the Greeks. These are the glorious Greeks. And so in that context, it, it, it made absolutely no sense to try to insist on explaining, you know, what Roman means and all of that. And you really then have the emergence of a, of a national Greek ideology um, that, you know, I mean, it obviously it had it had precedence and there were there were elements there that the leaders of the new state could use. Um, but basically, they had to teach people that, nah, you're not really Romans, you're Greeks. Um, and once you had a Greek state, then other people in the Ottoman Empire who shared the similar cultural profile, they spoke Greek, they were Chalcedonian Christians, and so forth, they started being called Greeks too. Um, though the Ottoman state continued to recognize them as Romans until... It went extinct in 1922 or something. That's um, I'm amazed at how modern it is. Yeah, 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 1922. And there's still groups. So there's still groups um, of, you know, in the, well, I mean, Turkey, uh, I mean, Istanbul a little bit, also in the Pontus area, who retain active memory, like their grandparents were Rum, Romans, and they know this and they, they will talk about it, sometimes in Turkish, uh, because that's their language now, um, sometimes in Greek. So yeah, it still exists. And, and that, that is, I mean, assuming that this is the last generation of those Romans, we are now Right, experiencing the fall of the Roman Empire. Oh my gosh, that's beautifully put. Um, it's so I have a very simple question. Hopefully, this doesn't sound strange, but so do the Romans of Byzantium? So their state, they call it Romania, meaning Roman land. Does this have anything to do with modern Romania at all in any way, or am I just like making this up? Uh, no, it does, but it's a. Um... <laughs> It's a parallel history. Um, it's, it's a different branch. Okay, cool. Okay. It's a different branch, kind of of the same thing, but it's a different branch. Um, so the term in Greek is Romania, um, which just means the land of the Romans or you know, whatever. And this is first attested in um, 357 in a text uh, by Bishop of Alexandria, um, 357 AD. Um, so very soon after the foundation of Constantinople, but he uses it in a way which implies that everybody knew what he was talking about. And he's addressing some bishops in, in, in um, upper Egypt, what we call Southern Egypt. So the, the term was pretty widespread by then. So we can imagine that it had been in circulation for a while. So yeah, Romania, and that's what they called it. It, it was the proper name of the state, and this is what people called it in the streets. Uh, though it took a while for the emperors to start using it in like official documents, like in treaties and laws and things like that. It took a while, but it was dominant uh, in the spoken language. So uh, I'm curious, yeah. I'm curious if, uh, so you just mentioned that there are still people who call themselves this. Have you actually gone and met with any of these people like on like research trips or anything like that? 
No, my research isn't. No, my research is in texts. I have met them, but not because I've gone to meet them. Um, I, I, you meet them at conferences. I go to Istanbul a lot and meet, you know, uh, just talking to people. And you know, they're also um, there are interviews that are posted on on YouTube where you can find you know these uh, in, interviews with uh, descendants of the Ottoman room, you know, in all kinds of settings and languages. Yeah, no, no, they they that's not difficult to find. It hasn't really been studied. Um, re- remember, there is a, I mean, in 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 modern scholarship, especially on Byzantium, there is a kind of bias toward like. Modern ethnicity, ethnicities that exist today, Byzantinists will consider like real. In other words, like if you're Jew or an Armenian or a Greek, that's a real thing. But if you're like a, a Greek speaking Roman in the Middle Ages, that's not a real thing. Um, it's a, some sort of artificial thing. It's not real. It's some label. It's some, you know, you have to peel the label off to find the real ethnicity underneath. I mean, this is a real bias in favor of currently existing groups. Um, and so when you find this label, it's often treated sort of dismissively as if it's some sort of, oh, it's some court propaganda or some, oh, that's an administrative label. That's not what they really are. We, you know, they're really something else. Um, and so it hasn't been treated with the kind of seriousness that it should, I think. Because if, if we agree that all ethnicities are you know, historical artifacts, they come into being and they go out of existence. Well, we have to treat them all the same, right? According to the same methodological principles. Do you and that think, hasn't been done. Do you think that your field of Byzantine studies will be renamed someday based on some of the missteps in the past and all the new things that your field has learned? Do you think that a, a renaming of the field is in order? I don't think so. I mean, I'm not passionate about that. I know people who are now, like once... Once you see what's happened, right, and once you look at the evidence and you see that this is Roman all the way through, um, yeah, you can draw that conclusion. I personally don't draw that conclusion um, because Byzantine studies is a by now an established and recognized field. Um, it, uh, it it has an institutional history and coherence. I mean, I wouldn't want to disrupt that, and I wouldn't want to create confusion. Um, in other words. An alternative term would have to be both specific and you know, non-confusing and historically accurate. And I've experimented with a number of them, but I don't see them working. Also, Byzantine and Byzantine studies is not a like an inherently derogatory term. Right? There's nothing wrong with it. I'm more of the opinion that if we can agree about the substance that we're talking about, the name shouldn't bother us so much. Um, Rather than change the name of the field, I'd like, for example, for the field to be um, recognized as part of the history of Rome. Um, I would like the field of Roman studies to open up a little bit, and there are signs that it is doing so, more so, in fact, than Byzantine studies, which um, are more, you know, I mean, if you have to be trained in Roman denialism, that makes you more of a partisan of it, whereas Ancient Roman historians aren't specifically trained in, you know, yeah. how to deny the obvious. Um, so I'd be more interested in, you know, changing the, our understanding, um, and let's see what comes from that, rather than forcing, you know, um, changing the labels and then seeing what comes. I don't know. I'm more interested in the uh, in the essence of the question. What is uh, what's next for you, for projects? I'm actually writing a new history of the Eastern Roman Empire, the whole thing from beginning to end, and beginning in this case being roughly the foundation of Constantinople. Um, so this is going to be a big project, um, probably in two volumes. I mean, remember, we're dealing with 1,123 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And and they're pretty well documented overall. There are a lot of sources. Um, I've been reading them for you know, almost, what, 30 years now, and... Um, I have, I take good notes. <laughs> so yeah. uh, the, working with the sources is ab- absolutely crucial. Like, I mean, this is how all of this occurred to me. I mean, you, 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 as a historian, you really have to work with the primary sources and check every modern concept, category, or thesis against those sources. I mean, it really has to work out that way. If it doesn't, you're just, you're, you know, you're building imaginary constructs. 
Um, so a new history of Byzantium, not focused on these kinds of issues necessarily. I kind of take these for granted. Uh, but we actually haven't had a, a, uh, a dedicated, long you know, history of, of East Roman society and uh, empire oh, for over 20 years now. Um, and I think there's a, there's need for a, one, uh, for a new one. Well, and in the meantime, we have Roman land, ethnicity, and empire in Byzantium out in 2019 from Harvard Press, which is fantastic. I'm, it's sitting right here on my desk, and I must say, just, just aesthetically, the cover is absolutely eye-catching and delightful as well. Oh, yes, they did a wonderful job. Um, at, at Harvard, I've also published another book called The Byzantine Republic, which is about how politics worked in Byzantium, so getting past the uh, you know, tales of intrigues and, uh, and eunuchs plotting in the shadows and things like this. Um, you know, how, how exactly did the public sphere operate? And they did a great job with that too, the Byzantine Republic. And in some respects, this is a s sequel to that, but I mean, they're not linked, um, but it's all exploring the, uh, the Romanness of Byzantium. The first uh, in the Republic was in terms of politics and how the political sphere was constituted and this one is in terms of ethnicity like who did these people think they were in relation to other peoples in the world and how did they treat them uh, when they had power over them i mean that's that's what ethnicity and empire is right if one group has power over another how, how does it treat them and why um so yeah they they, they kind of go together but each stands um uh, independently but yeah they did do a great job well, Anthony, I feel like I've earned uh, three undergraduate college credits in the last hour. Um, <laughs> I feel like so many of my own misconceptions about history have just been cleared up in so many ways. Like I'm think I'm like 22 year old Greg is thanking you right now so much um, because now college is just much less confusing to me. So I appreciate your time. This new book, Roman Land, is awesome. And I'm just so grateful to have been able to spend this hour with you today. Uh, thank you, Greg. No, I, I'm appreciative. Um, I mean, I do this because I, for fun, I do it because I really, really enjoy it. But it's also very nice to find people who are, who are deeply interested about in history um, and who want to learn about it, you know, and get into the nitty gritty of how ancient, you know, medieval and ancient societies worked, but also how we talk about them and where our concepts come from and, and all that. So I, I appreciate it very much, Greg. Thank you for having me on. Classical Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is composed and performed by Derek Strybin. You can find his music at www.wearewarmmusic.com. If you like this show, please rate it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can email me at classicalideas at outlook.com. Or find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash classical ideas podcast. Thanks so much for listening.